Hello, everyone. Welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. I'm Adam, and the focus of our lecture today is on semantics and conceptual metaphor. In the last lecture, we had reviewed some work by Searle, Austin, and Grice. So we looked at what is the Speech Act, as well as the article Literal Meaning by John Searle. And we focused on the context-sensitive nature of meaning. And we also looked at what a speech act is. We looked at Austin's distinction between a locutionary, illocutionary, and perlocutionary act. And then we also looked at Grice's cooperative principle and then the maxims, conversational maxims that fall out of that cooperative principle. We're going to continue today discussing uh, semantics, and then the discussion will lead into conceptual metaphor. However, one of my students asked a great question about the lecture, the last lecture we had. So before we dig into the new material for today, I want to go ahead and uh, respond to my student and use that as an opportunity to provide some clarification on what the distinction is between an intention and a convention. And that'll help us get an understanding of different views of meaning. All right, so from the last lecture, the last article on uh, meaning, or what is a speech act by John Searle, there was a quote. And this was a passage that one of my students had a question about. My student asked, um, hey, Adam, can you explain, can you provide a further clarification on what the distinction is between an intention and a convention? Okay, and what, what exactly is meant here by this paragraph? So let me go ahead and read you the paragraph and I'll go ahead and provide some um, a clarif um, clarifying discussion. Okay, so this is the passage from What is a Speech Act? Quote, at one point in the philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein says, say it's cold here and mean it's warm here. The reason we are unable to do this is that what we can mean is a function of what we are saying. Meaning is more than a matter of intention. It is also a matter of convention. So the question was, uh, what exactly is meant by convention in this passage? So let's go ahead and talk about that. What is the distinction between intention and convention? Okay, and why is Searle suggesting that meaning requires more than just intention and also requires a convention? I think that this point becomes very clear when we compare the meaning of words to the value of money. So let's go ahead and compare language with money for a moment. We can ask a similar question, how does money acquire value? For example, how does a $100 bill or one Bitcoin acquire the value that it does? Notice that a $100 bill, it's not worth $100 because the paper that it's printed on is worth $100, right? Similarly, for cryptocurrency, the digital asset is not worth what it's worth because of the value of the of its digital nature, right? But rather it has to do with the fact that there's social conventions and institutions in place that support the use of paper as money, right? Like as this kind of paper as worth $100 or this type of cryptocurrency as worth $35,000 or whatever per coin, okay? So notice that the use of paper as money or the use of certain cryptocurrencies as money is not a matter of just brute or simple intention, right? But also requires social conven conventions and institutions to be in place, right? And I highlight that the fact that it's not just a matter of intention that endows money with value, right? It's not that I can grab rocks and intend as hard as I can to use rocks as money, right? In some sense, my, my intention by itself is idle without the surrounding social conventions and financial institutions in place, okay? 
So that is an important distinction as we see that the value of money is not purely subjective. It's not purely a matter of inner mental phenomena, right? But rather money is primarily a social currency. And we participate in that social convention of money use when we become money users, okay? Similarly with the case of language, you might, you might think, right? And that language is not first and foremost inner mental intentional phenomena, but first and foremost, something that's social and public. And when we learn a language, we are learning how to participate in this social convention of using words to mean certain things, okay? And this is partly social conventions, right? Like how I use the word uh, warm versus cold, right? That's partly dictated by what my friends, family, colleagues, and community members understand those words to mean and how they use those words, okay? But also it's not just community members, like the people near me, there's also institutions in place, right? There's um, publishing companies and there's dictionaries and there's editors and, right? There's universities that teach uh, what words mean, right? There's English and linguistics courses. And you see that it's not just any single one thing, but there's this whole complex network that's sort of holding up and stabilizing the public use of words, as well as um, money, okay? And the, the insight here is that uh, for us to, for us to be able to intend mentally in our inner life, that's in some sense parasitic on the social practice, right? The social value of money, the social meaning of words is, is there. And then we, we grow into that and we acquire that, we, we pick that up. And then, then we, in some sense, internalize it when we are thinking and intending and doing all our inner um, activities, right? As individuals, okay? So similarly, just like I can't intend to use rocks as $100, I can't intend to use warm to mean cold. Right. And I can't just purely out of my intention use go to mean stop. Right. Or to meet to use stop to mean go. Right. If I say uh, stop the car, I can't mean that to say please continue driving or accelerate. Right. The, the word stop the car has a public meaning, and everyone that understands English takes that to mean a certain thing. Okay. Um, so that is, I hope, I hope that comparison with money helps to clarify how linguistic meaning and the value of currency is not based purely off of uh, intention, but also on social convention. Okay. All right, great. Now, one thing that we looked at in the last lecture is we we're looking at sort of contrasting views of meaning, okay? Uh, we talked about how there's a, a context insensitive view of meaning, right? Like there's a view that, excuse me, words and sentences mean what they do sort of in their own right and independent of the context, right? The way that words and sentences have meaning is due to the the internal relationships between the items themselves without reference or without being indexed to contextual factors or things that are outside of the locution, okay? We saw that, that that was one view. And then when we read Searle, we saw that there's an alternative view that challenges that view, right? And the view that we had considered in the last lecture was that maybe meaning is more context sensitive rather than context insensitive, right? Where it may be the case that words and sentences have the meaning that they do sort of relative to background assumptions, right? Or indexed to, um, by pinning down certain aspects to contextual conditions, right? And we saw that with Searle's 
example of the cat is on the mat, which seems like a very straightforward example of a, a sentence that should just mean something directly, right? But we saw that the cat is on the mat, right? Although that may be intuitively true, we saw that, well, you know, if we dramatically change the context, maybe we go into outer space, right? Deep into outer space where, you know, the cat on the mat, maybe now in outer space, it's like the mat is actually on the cat, right? So when we drift further away from the earth, uh, just because the cat and the mat are next to each other or contiguous in terms of spatio-temporal relations, doesn't necessarily mean that one is on top of the other, right? I'm also, I use an example of if we're at like a quantum level, right? Say I'm Ant-Man and I'm looking, before I shrink down, I see a cat on the mat, but now what if I shrink down, right? And now I'm like at a quantum level, well, it may no longer be the case that I see things at a scale where there is a cat, there is a mat, and the cat stands in a relation of being on top of the mat, right? At that quantum level, the world may be a little bit more fuzzier and complicated, right? Things just change dramatically when we're dealing with a quantum, um, quantum mechanics rather than um, like classical physics, right? So we see that based on context, right? We can, I can give you more background information to continue to readjust your interpretation of a cat on a mat and whether that sentence is true or false, okay? And so we had considered that it may be the case that a, a statement such as the cat is on the mat isn't true or false until it's considered in relation to some background context, okay? All right, now I wanna continue discussing the alternative theories of meaning um, because, of course, there's uh, more details to discuss, okay? Um, what we're going to do here in the next few slides is we're going to discuss the picture theory of meaning and the usage-based account of meaning, which are two alternative views of meaning, okay? What's really interesting about this is that one of my favorite philosophers, Ludwig Wittgenstein, he was a proponent of both views, right? At different points in time. The earlier view that he had, which was presented in the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus was the picture theory of meaning, right? And this is in the spirit of the first view of meaning that we have been discussing, right? Where the meaning of a sentence is based on the linguistic items and the relation to each other, right? Um, looking, focusing on the locution itself, okay? Later on, Wittgenstein is going to challenge his own earlier view, right? So the view that he presented earlier in the Tractatus, he later challenges in the philosophical investigations, okay? So I think that that's really cool that he's able to present two different views and challenge his own earlier work, okay? We're going to... Uh, look at his presentation of the picture theory of meaning. I'm gonna explain the view. And in doing so, this is the goal of this is to help um, clarify the context independent view of meaning that we had been considering in the le previous lecture last week, as well as we have been sort of um, mentioning it in passing uh, in the last several weeks of the course. Okay, and then the new view of the usage-based account, which we introduced in the last lecture, right? We were getting into the usage-based account of meaning when we started talking about the context sensitivity of language, but then also especially when we started talking about pragmatics and the use of language, right? Um, so we're gonna get a nice, clarifying discussion today on these different views of meaning, right? Context independent or context insensitive versus context dependent or context sensitive views, okay? And we can get a nice uh, distinction between these views by contrasting Wittgenstein's earlier and later work, okay? So let's go ahead and look at some of the propositions or statements that are provided in the Tractatus 
that sort of present the view. Okay, and we won't go through the whole book, of course, but I'll just highlight some of the relevant propositions. Okay. So Wittgenstein makes several claims. One is uh, we make to ourselves pictures of facts. Okay. The picture is a model of a reality. The elements of the picture stand in the picture for the objects. The picture consists in the fact that its elements are combined with one another in a definite way. The picture is a fact. That the elements of the picture are combined with one another in a definite way represents that the things are so combined with one another, okay? And these different propositions, they're indicating a view that there's something about language and there's something about the world such that the structure of language pictures the structure of the world, right? Just like a photograph, there's something about the structure of a photograph that resembles or corresponds to the way that the world is, right? Like a picture of a dog is an accurate picture of a dog if the parts and the relations in the picture map onto or correspond to the parts and the relations in the real world, right? So we see that here Wittgenstein is trying to point out the fact that there's something about language and there's something about the world such that one can picture the other, right? There's items and relations in one that correspond or isomorphically map onto items and relations in the other, right? Language, world, okay? And um, when that relation is accurate, then that's an accurate picture or a true statement. Okay, and when the structure of the picture does not correspond to the way that the world is, that's an inaccurate picture. And when the structure of our sentence does not correspond to the way the world is, then that's a false statement. Okay, the insight is there's, there's something about the items and their relation, right, that makes it true or false. Since since the items and the relation will either correspond or not correspond to the items and the relation in the world. Okay. All right. And I'm going to go ahead and in the next slide, use pictures and uh, sentences to make this even more clear for you. Okay. All right. So we see here a couple important things. Here is, imagine that this is a, the real world, okay? So this image that I have on the far right is an image of a cat and the cat is on the mat, okay? But uh, for right now, just pretend that this is not just a picture, but this is the real world, okay? So here we have a real cat on the mat, okay? And Searle's drawing right here, this is the drawing by Searle that represents a cat being on a mat. So this is his picture of a cat on the mat. And we see that this picture in some sense is true or it's, it's accurate if the objects and relations in the picture correspond to or map onto the objects and relations in the world, okay? So we see in the world, we have a cat and then there's a mat and then one is, in a relation to the other, okay? And then what we can do is take that over from the world to the picture. And we see there's another object, which is a cat, another object, which is a mat, and they stand in the same relation of one being on top of the other, okay? And we see here that insofar as the relation, insofar as the items and the relations are maintained from the world to the picture, that the, the picture remains an accurate representation of the world, okay? So that is why we, we can call this sort of like a picture theory of meaning, okay? What does this picture mean? Well, it means the cat's on the mat in virtue of its relation, the structural relation that it has, okay? And notice that we didn't really 
index it to any context or we didn't do anything context sensitive with it. We're just looking at objects and the relations, okay? Another way we can say this is that this picture is accurate because it corresponds to an atomic fact in the world, right? Where we can think of an atomic fact as some basic fact about the world that is just true, okay? And maybe a cat being on a mat is one such atomic or basic fact, okay? All right. Uh, importantly, now we need to understand, because this, this isn't just, I'm not just providing you with a picture theory of pictures, but a picture theory for language, right? How language also has a certain type of meaning. Like, um, just like this picture, this drawing is accurate in virtue of its objects and relations corresponding to the objects and relations in the real world, we see that in this linguistic structure, the cat is on the mat, right? Which I have for you right here, this top sentence that's bolded, okay? We see that although this sentence doesn't look like the cat, right? It's not like this word the or this word cat looks like this object here, but that's not the important thing here. The important thing here is if there can be a relationship within the uh, sentence or within the linguistic picture that corresponds to the, the um, objects and relations in the real world, okay? And we see that there is such a relation that's preserved, okay? And we see, for example, that just like in this picture, right, we have a cat, a mat, and then one in st um, standing in the relation of being on top of the other, we see that in some sense, we can like produce a relation in the sentence by representing the cat being to the left and the mat being on the right, okay? So what I'm trying to say is in our language, we can use word order, right? To sort of represent what we're representing here in the picture. Okay, so the cat, right? This thing over here corresponds to the cat that's on the top, okay? The mat that's over here on the right, right? Corresponds to the thing that's on the bottom. And then this in the middle is on, right? Corresponds to that relation between the two, okay? And with different sentences, we can have different mappings. Then like with the pat, if we uh, restated the sentence in the passive form, right? So instead of the cat is on the mat, uh, we can say um, the mat is something that the cat is on, right? And we can just sort of turn it into a passive. That's not the, the important thing. The important, like the important thing is not how, uh, whether the cat's in the front of the mat or in back of the mat, the important thing is that we can sort of do some sort of relationship preserving technique or mapping from one to the other, okay? So even if we form the passive of the sentence, there's still a relationship. There's a way that relates that passive or active form to the picture. And that's the important insight here, okay? That's sort of the important idea from the picture theory of meaning is that the objects, the linguistic objects and relations, right? The cat is on the mat, can be mapped onto reality in some way, right? With the cat is on the mat, okay? And in some sense, that's what we're doing with language. And with more complicated examples, we're just doing more complicated objects and relations, uh, mappings from the linguistic structure, our sentences, to the world, okay? And we see that like nouns would stand for entities in this view, right? Uh, cat, the word would stand for a thing in the world, like the entity, okay? Um, so we see that um, this is a compelling view of how language works, okay? But, um, oh, one more thing before I uh, qualify, right? We see that because this sentence, the cat is on the mat, does preserve 
relations, objects and relations from reality, that this is true. But the mat is on the cat and the dog is on the mat are false because they're not maintaining objects and relations from the world into language in the appropriate way, right? Um, the mat is on the cat would suggest some other relationship and the dog is on the mat would also suggest some other relationship, right? Like the dog is on the mat, it's an inaccurate, this is a false sentence, just like it would be an inaccurate picture if what was drawn here was a picture of a dog, okay, with like floppy ears and whatnot, okay? So we see that we need to maintain objects, right? Like the cat instead of a dog, right? And the relations, like it being on top of rather than underneath for a picture or a linguistic picture sentence to be true, okay? All right. So uh, I was gonna say, this is a nice um, compelling picture of linguistic meaning, especially if your focus in language, philosophy of language is on like facts and declarative sentences, right? Sentences of the form, the cat is on the mat or right, all dogs, blah, 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 right? Factual statements, okay? Um, things are gonna get a little trickier. We're gonna have a harder time holding on to this account of meaning when we think about linguistic forms and practices which are not of the declarative or, or assertive form, okay? So now that we have an understanding of the picture theory of meaning, the view of meaning that was presented by Wittgenstein and the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, let's go ahead and now look at the alternative view, okay, presented by the later Wittgenstein and philosophical investigations. And this is more of a usage-based account, okay? So rather than truth being the preservation of objects and relations from the world to language, here we see that meaning is based uh, in abbreviated form, the meaning of a word is its use in the language, okay? Or at least for many types of words, okay? All right, so um, in the philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein starts in section one, right? Or early in the, the book, he um, provides a quote and uh, from St. Augustine, and then he uses it as a way to sort of introduce his older view of language, right? The picture theory of meaning, okay? And so this is sort of just a quick, um, quote from him uh, pointing out his earlier view, and then he's gonna offer his later view, okay? So this is the view, right? The individual words in the language name objects, right? Like the word cat maps onto ca a cat in the world, right? And sentences are combinations of such names, right? Cat, mat, is on, right? A sentence is just a combination of um, such names. Cat, mat, is on. In this picture of language, we find the roots of the following idea. Every word has a meaning. This meaning is correlated with the word. It is the object for which the word stands. Okay, picture theory of meaning. The later view, which he essentially uses the Tractatus as a series of different exercises, linguistic exercises, right? To illuminate how we use language. Okay, um, later he'll um, indicate that for a large class of cases, though not for all, in which we employ the word meaning, it can be defined thus. The meaning of a word is its use in the language. Okay, so you might hear some people say that, ah, the later Wittgenstein has a theory that all word, the meaning of all words is, is the use, their use in the language. Okay, but notice that he doesn't make such a general claim right? But just for a large class of cases, maybe for most words, or for many that occur in natural language, but not necessarily for all, okay? Um, so an important thing that we see from what Wittgenstein states here, as well as what Wittgenstein shows in his work, 
right? So um, not only does he make different claims, but also the way that he carries out his work is very different in the Tractatus and the investigations, right? In the Tractatus, he's in some sense building a system. And we see that he's numbering propositions. So that way they stand in the appropriate relation with each other, okay? Um, this is in some sense like a, a kind of theory building, right? Or system building, right? The later view is not building a system in that same sort of way. But in some sense, it's a series of exercises and clarifications, right? That can show us what we do with language and different types of activities, okay? And then rather than providing some comprehensive system for a philosophy of meaning, right? Uh, the later Wittgenstein is gonna show us how language is used. So that way we aren't so perplexed by philosophical questions about meaning, okay? So the usage-based view of meaning is not that our words represent objects and relations, okay? But rather that our words have meaning for what we do with them and how we use them, okay? And remember that we used some examples from the last lecture, certain performative utterances like I do, right? When you get married, you say I do, right? And that, that, that action, right, that speech act creates a new um, social situation for you, right? A new legal situation even, right? It, it changes the way taxes are done and your financial arrangements and all sorts of things, right? When we, and we saw importantly that saying I do isn't just a report, like a, a matter of a true or false statement about like what I did that day, right? When I'm, when I'm at the altar and the person says, do you blah, blah, blah. And I say, I do. That's not a, a true or false report, right? But rather a speech act that commits me, that, um, that invokes or creates a new social reality, okay? And, and that's sort of one of the insights here is that meaning is not just about reporting, right? Meaning is not just sort of presenting a picture of how the world is, of how objects, how objects, how objects in the world stand in relation to each other. That's not all we do with words, like sort of feed each other pictures of how the world is or isn't. But what we also do is we use words to do new things, to create new things, okay? Not just uh, good or bad pictures of the world. Okay, it's very important. Okay, and we see that if you're interested in things like how does hate speech dehumanize somebody, right? Or how can I reappropriate language to uplift someone or build rapport, right? How do what what are we doing when we lie? What are we doing with language when we say things, right? When we give promises and all these sort of things. We see that by adopting a more usage-based account, this sort of opens up the terrain for um, more fascinating explorations, right, in terms of speech acts, possible speech acts, and not just reports, okay, or assertions. All right. So now we're gonna go ahead and transition into the article for today on lexical semantics, okay? And as we talk through the article by Ding Fan, we'll uh, just see that a lot of what we've been discussing in the last lecture and earlier in this lecture will carry over to the main focus of the lecture today, okay? So the two articles that we read for today, one was entitled Cognitive Approaches to Lexical Semantics, and this was published in Language and Linguistics Compass. Uh, the other article that we read for today was by Lakoff, on conceptual metaphor. All right, and what's nice about this article is that we're gonna talk a little bit about categorization. We'll think about classical approaches to categorization as well as uh, newer approaches or alternative approaches to categorization. Uh, in particular, we're gonna contrast between the standard criterial attribute model 
as well um, contrast that with uh, the prototype model. Okay, and then we'll also, since we're sort of contrasting these today, right, uh, context sensitive versus context insensitive <clears throat> accounts of meaning, the standard criterial attribute model versus the prototype model of categorization. And then we'll also contrast the dictionary account of meaning with the encyclopedic account of meaning. Okay. So uh, categorization, what is it? What do we do when we're categorizing objects in the world? Okay. Well, categorization just refers to the basic human human ability to organize and store our experiences, right? So when I go out into the world, I see uh, many particulars, right? Uh, for example, I may have seen 36 dogs today. However, I don't just see 36 instances. I also see like one kind of animal, like dogs versus cats, right? 36 dogs is what I saw as opposed to cats. Right. I also may have seen um, different varieties of dogs, right? Like subcategories of that category. Right? I may have seen golden retrievers um, or Rottweilers or bulldogs or terriers or what have you. Right. Um, so we see that category categorization is very important and it's part of what allows us to be systematic with our language and our cognitions, right? We saw that one of the amazing abilities that language gives us is um, productive cognition and systematic cognition, right? Um, so categorization is what allows us to be systematic with our cognition. It allows us to replace like items for like items. So when we saw in our tree diagrams, this is what allows us to replace NPs, noun phrases, with noun phrases, and replace verb phrases with verb phrases. Okay. The traditional Aristotelian view of categorization, right, like how categorization works in the mind, um, we can call this the standard criterial attribute model. This view insists on necessary and sufficient conditions for membership on the basis of a precise hierarchy shared properties and equal status among category members. Okay, so for example, you might ask like, what is a bird? Okay, well, a bird is a kind of animal, right? So we see that animal is the larger category and within that category of animal, we have bird, right? And then within the category of bird, we have the types of birds, right? Robin, sparrow, bluebird, canary, blackbird, dove, penguin, and ostrich. Okay. Importantly, on the traditional view of categories, on the standard criterial attribute model of categories, the, we have a definition, right, um, and of what constitutes membership in this category, like a definition of what a bird is or what a dog is, and whatever satisfies that definition counts as a legitimate equal instance of that item, right? So if I give you a definition of a dog, well, any dog that satisfies the definition of dog is an equally good version of dog, right? So based on this view, right, there isn't better or worse birds or dogs, right? They either satisfy the definition for dogs or they don't. And insofar as they satisfy the necessary and sufficient conditions, right? Um, what that means is that for something to be a dog, right, we're trying to pick out everything that's a dog and only those things that are dogs, right, necessary and sufficient conditions for doghood, okay, and whatever um, satisfies those conditions is as good of an instance of a dog as any other instance that also satisfies those conditions. Okay, so we, we see, we're gonna talk about this more later in the course when we get to truth conditional semantics, but we see that we're determining what things are based on their conditions, right? Um, and as long as those conditions are satisfied, it's an equally good member of a bird or a dog, okay? Now that we have an idea of 
this standard criterial attribute model, let's go ahead and look at um, one way that we might look at this, okay? So uh, one way that we might adopt the standard criterial attribute model is with necessary and sufficient conditions articulated in the form of a definition, okay? So you might hold on to this view, right? But, um, and as, a, as someone that holds on to this view, offer a definition for what a thing is, okay? So you might say, well, in order for something to be a bird, it has to satisfy this dictionary definition of birdness or birdhood, okay? Another way to approach this, with, which is related, right, is it comes from semantic feature analysis, okay? So here, um, this can either be the same as the, the dictionary view. It can also be slightly different, right? Um, here, the idea in semantic feature analysis is either in the form of a, a structure definition or through the um, through providing uh, features, right? Like which I'm going to show you right here, that we can pick out what a member of the category is. Okay, so maybe instead of maybe I don't know what the the precise articulation of a definition for a dog is, but or a bachelor, right? But maybe I can provide you with uh, features, right? And what I might say, for example, is that. I can give you a definition of what a bachelor, a bachelor is, like a bachelor is an unmarried man, right? But, or I can instead, I can give you just a list of features that bachelors have, okay? And you can see how the two can be very tightly related in that if I'm able to articulate the features, like the full list of features, then I can provide a definition, right? I would just have to pack those features into the definition, okay? But maybe, Right? You can still leave a little bit room for distinction where maybe you just want to provide a list of the features without putting it, structuring it into a definition. Okay. Well, semantic feature analysis allows you just to provide the features. And what we can do in semantic feature analysis is for any concept, we can provide features that are necessary and sufficient for that concept. Okay. So, for example, the concept a bachelor can ask yourself, what is a bachelor, right? Um, and what a bachelor is, is just a, a human male that is not married. And what we see, the way that we've indicated those sort of three features, either the possession or lack of feature, right, is with the plus or minus uh, sort of notation here, okay? so. Um, I say that a bachelor, the concept bachelor, it has to be a human. So I put plus human there, okay? Also, it has to be a male. So I put plus male there, okay? But also the concept of bachelor is such that that person cannot be married. So then here I put minus married, okay? And you see with features like human, male, married, and so on, and plus or minus, right, either including it or excluding it, we can sort of create a, a set of features in which we can um, sort of artic articulate or demarcate certain concepts like bachelor or dog or cat, okay? Um, so this is sort of a, a very neat idea, right? Um, However, there's challenges to this view, right? Both to semantic feature analysis, as well as to the, the dictionary definition approach, right? To picking out categories, okay? And uh, this challenge here is provided in these, it's provided in the two questions that I have for you. Uh, just ask yourself, think about a Buddhist monk. Is a Buddhist monk a bachelor? And it seems really bizarre to assert that, right? That a Buddhist monk is a bachelor, even though we can see that a Buddhist monk is still a human, is still male and is not married, right? Similarly, we can ask for a Catholic priest, is a Catholic priest a bachelor? And our intuition is to think that there's something 
wrong or misleading or false about that, right? There's something highly inaccurate about categorizing Catholic priests as bachelors, right? Even though Catholic priests are human, males, and not married, right? They, in some sense, fit the definition of bachelors, right? Buddhist monks and Catholic priests satisfy the definition of bachelor. They also satisfy our semantic feature analysis of bachelor. However, it seems highly misleading or inaccurate to categorize Buddhist monks and Catholic priests as bachelors, right? There's something about the concept of bachelor that seems to suggest that they're not just unmarried um, human males, but also those that may be open to marriage or something of that nature, right? The important thing here is that as we start to consider the different categories from natural language, right? It's gonna become increasingly difficult to provide necessary and sufficient conditions, a dictionary definition, or a strict semantic feature analysis for those categories or concepts, okay? Another challenge, right? Sort of just another example of this challenge against the standard criterial attribute model um, comes from the concept of gain. And this is a concept that Wittgenstein discusses in the philosophical investigations, okay? So here with the concept of game, we'll see that categories don't have clear cut boundaries that their members uh, share, right? Um, they may not have defining properties, okay? Um, so think about the concept game and try to provide a semantic feature analysis or dictionary definition that has necessary and sufficient conditions that pick out all games and only games, right? And we'll, we'll see that this is very hard, if not impossible, okay? And I'm gonna help you think about some different types of games, right? So we have card games like solitaire and poker. Solitaire is more of an individual game, but poker, you play with partners, okay? And think about all the other types of card games that exist, right? Uno, blackjack, and so on. We also have different types of uh, board games or games that we play at, at home, right? Maybe it's on a board like Monopoly or Scrabble, or maybe it's a game that you build, right? Like a physical structure like Jenga, right? Where you have to try to balance, right? We see that there's sort of family games at home that test different skills, right? Balance, uh, structural stability versus, um, you know, um, uh, linguistic ability, word knowledge, working memory, and things like that, okay? We also have video games, right? Very different type of game. Uh, Street Fighter and Final Fantasy. So we have Street Fighter, uh, like combat games, which you have to have really good reaction time, right? To be good at fighting games. You have to be able to react and put together combinations. And, you know, you have to have uh, quick reaction time and be able to combine movements together right, to perform combinations, okay? Um, but th that's a different type of game than Final Fantasy or like an RPG or role-playing game in which maybe your reaction time isn't so important, but you have to think more in terms of strategy or um, more in terms of like long-term goals, right? Leveling up, conquering different territories, uh, picking up certain weapons first, and then going somewhere else and performing certain actions with those weapons and so on, okay? Next, we have outdoor games based on sports. So we have games like horse for basketball, where you have to compete against each other by, uh, like person A will take a shot from uh, a certain position on the court. And then if they make it, then person B has to replicate that shot from that position. And if they miss, then they get a letter like H. Okay. And since I love skateboarding, there's a, a horse version for skateboarders called skate. And for example, I'll, I might do a trick like a 360 flip or a switch frontside flip. And if I land it, now you have to perform that same trick. And if you, uh, if you mess up and you don't land the trick, then you get a letter like S. Okay. So we see 
another type of game, okay? But very different than video games, board games, card games, all right? We also have outdoor games that are based on other skills and activities, not based on sports, right? Like these are more open-ended games like hide and seek, right? And catch, like hide and seek, there isn't such sort of strict rules. It's a little bit more open-ended. Like we're, we might be kids and never taught rules for hide and seek, but you know, I might sort of, we can sort of improvise and like you'll hide for a little bit and then I'll find you and we'll run around and then I'll hide and you know, you'll find me, right? Um, and then catch, right? I might play catch by myself against the wall or I might play catch with a partner. Um, I might play catch with my dog. Right. And so we see that uh, games don't even have to be with humans, but also you might play games with animals and other things. OK. And then finally, we have team games. Right. Just the last example I'm going to mention for today. Otherwise, we could just spend a whole semester talking about different examples of games. But we have team games like Capture the Flag, Group Laser Tag. And these are just games. The reason I wanted to include this is just to emphasize that not all games are competitive. Some games are um, collaborative, right? And the goal is not to beat each other, but maybe to help each other perform well, okay? And you might use these types of games for sort of building a rapport with colleagues at work or whatnot, okay? So we see that if we really sit down and think about all the different types of games that exist, that it becomes increasingly difficult to provide just sort of one clean definition for what a game is, right? Or one semantic feature analysis for what a game must be to count as a game, okay? All right, um, but the important insight is here is not that there needs to be like one definition or one list of semantic features, the existence of which every game is a game because it satisfies those features, right? But rather, so what I'm trying to say is it's not like I need a definition or a perfect list for which card games, board games, video games, outdoor games of both kinds and team games must satisfy to be games, okay? That would be the standard criterial attribute model, okay? on the usage-based account or on the alternative view that we're gonna see here, it's that what's important is not that each kind of game satisfy all the features, but that there's a large set of overlapping, overlapping features from game to game, okay? So imagine that like, like card games, even though like card games, board games and video games, they don't share the same exact set of features, right? Like uh, card games, you use cards and video games, you use um, computer console or video game consoles. So clearly there's already a distinction between those two, but we see that there's still a large amount of overlap between those, okay? So there's still something like um, a way that you can progress or do better or win. Right? There's like a challenging component. There's like an entertainment component, right? We can still sort of like pick out a large overlapping set here. So here what we can do is we can sort of think of on this view, um, on the standard criterial attribute model, all games have to have the same set of features. But on the alternative model, which we're going to discuss next, what's important is that there's overlap between when we go from game to game. Okay, or that there's overlap when we go from bird to bird. Okay, so maybe not all ostriches have the same features as doves, but ostriches and doves still share features, right? And it's that shared set of features, or the fact that instances of our categories share lots of features that we can still use the category label, right? We can still use it appropriately, okay, to pick out dogs versus cats, okay? Because notice that even if a category is just sort of like a collection of features rather than a strict set or a strict definition of features, we see that we can still distinguish between cats and dogs or cats and airplanes, right? And that features that are common to most cats 
are going to be very different than features that are common to most airplanes. Okay, so we don't even really need like strict definitions or absolutely strict semantic feature lists to distinguish between cats and airplanes, right? As long as for the most part, right, we're tracking the majority of relevant features that we can distinguish between concepts. Okay, that's sort of the important insight here. Okay, so instead of necessary and sufficient properties shared by all category members, the membership of a category like game can follow a gradients from prototypical members or good examples to peripheral members or bad examples. Figure three on the next slide demonstrates the goodness of example rating of the bird category in Britain. Okay, and what's also really cool or interesting about uh, this approach, we're looking at goodness of example ratings of the bird category in Britain. But what's interesting and what I encourage you to ask is when we think about birds or the bird category in other regions, right? Like in North America, do we have the same prototypes, right? For what is a good bird or the best instance for bird as speakers or language users in Britain or other areas of the world, okay? So it's always fun to think about sort of um, how our concepts or knowledge um, may be slightly different from culture to culture, but still grounded in basic principles, right? Like a prototype group uh, organization type of principle, okay? All right, so here, rather than thinking of birds like this, so we saw that on the standard criterial attribute model, all birds, right? All birds are here as instances of animals and all the birds are of equal standing with respect to each other. Okay, so like a robin and a sparrow are equally good versions of birds. Here in this alternative approach to categorization um, that's motivated from lexical semantics, we see that we no longer have birds that are equal members or are equally as equally good examples as other birds, right? We see here now that some birds are rated as better examples of birds than others, okay? So this is what we call a goodness of example rating, okay? Where we, we can give participants or subjects um, a list of different category members, right? You can do this for dogs, you can do this for furniture. Um, in this case, we're using birds. And we just have partic participants rate, right? Like on a scale, how good of an example is this bird, right? And we see that the best example of the category bird is a robin with a rating of seven out of eight, okay? And the worst example for the category bird is a dove with a rating of one out of eight, okay? So the worst, the better examples for this category receive higher ratings and the worst examples for this category receive lower ratings, okay? And that's our little Robin right here, see? So I just made this even more clear on this slide right here, right? So we have dove, blackbird, canary, bluebird, blue jay, sparrow, and Robin. And these, ca uh, these category members are provided right here on the right, right? Um, I wanted to make this very clear for you because it could be a little confusing because sometimes we associate what's at the top with what's best, but notice here, okay? Um, that here, right, the worst, yeah, the, the worst has the lowest rating, okay? So at the top is Dove, okay? So Dove, although it's the top over here, this is the worst, this has the worst rating, okay? So this is the worst example of a bird in Britain. And we see that it's worst by taking this color and then looking over here in the figure. And we see that, ah, it was rated a one out of eight in the goodness of example rating, okay? So 
here, worst is on top, okay? Um, I just wanted to put this here because it can be a little confusing, like, isn't the worst, isn't the best supposed to be on the top, okay? But this is just sort of how they um, organized it in the figure, okay? And the best, the bird that had, was rated the best example of bird was a robin with a rating of seven out of eight. Okay. And that's why I put Robin closest to the best and Dove closest to the worst. And then, right, Bluebird is somewhere in the middle there, as we can see over here. Okay. All right, cool. And ask yourself, right, with dogs, what would be some good examples of, what would be like the best example of a dog? What would be like a more peripheral or not so good example of a dog? And you can use this sort of approach to replicate and extend this work. Okay. You might even just take this same list of birds and replicate this study in North America and see if um, participants in North America give the same ratings or give different ratings for birds. All right, so now we have a view of different approaches to categorization, right? We have this approach, the prototype approach, and then we have the standard criterial at attribute approach, okay? Now let's go ahead and uh, look at models of word meaning, okay? We have uh, in the article by Ding Feng, uh, the dictionary model and the encyclopedic model were mentioned, okay? So what's the dictionary model and what's the encyclopedic model of word meaning? Well, the dictionary model of word meaning assumes that the words of a language are associated with fixed and determinate meanings, right? This is similar to in the beginning of the lecture and in the last lecture, we were talking about that, right? Sort of like the context independent or context insensitive account, okay? Um, on the other hand, we have the encyclopedic model of word meaning which highlights the importance of both the profiled concept and the general background knowledge upon which the concept is profiled. Okay, and so remember, this is related, the second view of word meaning, the encyclopedic model is related to the discussion from Searle, right? Where Searle was talking about the importance of context, right? And here we see that the encyclopedic model of word meaning is more concerned about sort of the concept and the background knowledge that is related to it, okay? So the dictionary model is just trying to give you a, a just a definition, sort of like just the locution, right? With the necessary and sufficient conditions in the locution such that that can hold as a context insensitive um, sort of criteria for what category, what counts as a proper member of the category, okay? The encyclopedic model is going to say it's not just the locutions, right? But there's also going to be background contextual information that also is important for understanding categories, okay? So there's something not just about, there's something about our knowledge of what dogs are, right? It's not just, does it satisfy the definition, but also like that this type of dog is a better example of dog than this other type of dog, okay? And that type of knowledge, right? Like goodness of example ratings, that's more about general background knowledge, right? Tying that concept, right? The profiled concept to our background knowledge, okay? And if you think that is, important. If you think that's the right way to go in characterizing word meaning, then you're on the encyclopedic model of word meaning, okay? If you think that we don't need to tie concepts to background knowledge, but if you think, you know what, the locution view is right, right? Like maybe just semantic features or the definition can uniquely pick out um, all appropriate members of a category. Well, then you're on board with the dictionary model of word meaning, okay? So I hope we're starting to see that these different views, although they pick out slightly distinct things, they start to clump together, right? And that we have 
a dictionary model of word meaning. You have a context insensitive views of language, um, the view of the, the picture theory of uh, meaning as presented by Wittgenstein, right? And then on the other hand, we have the encyclopedic model of word meaning. We have the view of meaning as use, right? And we have the view presented by Wittgenstein, the later Wittgenstein and the investigations, okay? So we have nice contrasts here between our the concepts that we've covered for our lectures on semantics and pragmatics. All right. Um, just to be very clear, the standard criterial attribute model of categorization insists that category membership is based on necessary and sufficient conditions shared by all members. And the prototype model of categorization denies that, okay? Um, instead, the prototype model of categorization uh, suggests that category membership um, consists of prototypes, graded membership, and goodness of examples. The encyclopedic model of meaning and the prototype model of categorization, they go together um, as the scaffolding principles for lexical semantics. All right. In this article by Ding Feng, there was also a nice discussion about conceptual metaphors. So we see how the tail end of the article by Ding Feng is going to lead us nicely into the next article by Lakoff. Okay. So we have um, conceptual metaphors. Um, let's consider some conceptual metaphors. Okay, so here's one metaphorical statement. The surgeon is a butcher. And ask yourself, what does that mean? When someone tells you the surgeon is a butcher, what are they intending to communicate to you with that? And then here to help us think about this, I've provided a reading, right? To sort of like help you interpret the metaphorical statement, okay? So when we read the metaphorical statement, the surgeon is a butcher, what we're asking ourselves, or we're sort of, saying to ourselves is, well, the surgeon has features that butchers have. So which relevant features do butchers have, right? Why I provide the reading for you here is so that we can clearly distinguish the source domain from the target domain in our metaphorical statement, okay? So by source domain, this is the domain in which we're going to sort of get the relevant features from, okay? And the target domain is gonna be the, the category in which we're now applying those features, okay? And that's why I'm asking from this reading, which relevant features do butchers have, right? Because that is the source domain. So what we're gonna do with this metaphorical statement, the surgeon is a butcher, is we're gonna think about butchers, the source domain, think about what relevant features they have. Okay, so maybe they, they use like a big instrument and they just sort of hack away at um, meat, okay? And actually, right, um, surge, I mean, butchers can actually be very precise, right? So no, um, notice that our, the domains don't have to be factual, but just sort of like, they could be stereotypical or just sort of general knowledge, okay? But what we're doing here to understand what someone might mean by, ah, the surgeon is a butcher, right? We're gonna think about butchers and the qualities or features that they have, okay? So maybe the butcher has a big dull instrument or an instrument that's not as precise as a surgical instrument and they just cleave off large sections of meat, okay? Now, if we wanna apply those features to the case of a surgeon, we could see how that would be undesirable for a surgeon to use a large instrument and to sort of just hack away at meat in large chunks rather than in a precise sort of way, right? So when we grab relevant features from the source domain and we apply them to the target domain, right? When we grab features from butchers and apply them to surgeons to understand the metaphorical statement, the surgeon is a butcher, we see that we can 
understand what is what is intended to be communicated and interpret the valence of that intended communication as negative, right? When someone says the surgeon is a butcher, right? The intended valence, right? The valence of evaluation is negative, okay? All right. Notice though, we can formulate a, another metaphorical statement. For example, the butcher is a surgeon, okay? And the reading for this is the butcher has features that surgeons have. So which relevant features do surgeons have, okay? With this metaphorical statement, now we're thinking about the features that surgeons have. And we might think that they they use fine instruments, right? And they uh, cut away or make incisions very carefully, right? With the utmost care, okay? And we could think now, right? Ah, the butcher is a surgeon, right? Well, that must be like an amazing restaurant, right? Well, if there's a, if there's someone that's sort of cutting your prime rib or whatnot with the um, execution and precision of a surgeon, right? Then that must be like a highly trained um, professional that's using very precise instrumentation instruments for that um, task, right? So we see that by grabbing features from our source domain, in this case, surgeons, and applying them to the target domain, in this case, butchers, we see that the valence of our evaluation is now positive rather than negative, okay? And this is in, in general, how we understand our metaphorical statements, okay? With source domains and target domains and sort of uh, taking relevant features from one and mapping them to the other, okay? And here is just a few tables just to make this even clearer for you. And we see that there's a lot of our everyday languages of this form, right? It's not the case that conceptual metaphors or metaphorical statements are peripheral or tangential to knowledge. Right, and our communication. But in some sense, they may even be central, right? A lot of how we communicate with each other is very much metaphorical. So the surgeon is a butcher, marriage is a journey, life is a journey, okay? Um, all these are metaphorical, right? And we see in the table um, how we can um, do the mappings from features from the source to the target domains. All right, for the sake of time, let's go ahead and continue. But I think it's a fun exercise. I, I encourage you to pause the video and think of a metaphorical statement and try to work out the source and target domains, as well as relevant features that you can map from the source to the target. All right. All right, next, let's go ahead and discuss this article, our last article for today, article by Lakoff, Mapping the Brain's Metaphor Circuitry. All right, so according to Lakoff, one of the central figures in conceptual metaphor theory, metaphor is primarily conceptual and secondarily linguistic. What we mean by this is traditionally, right, metaphor was considered sort of not important, or at least not important for cognitive science. But metaphor was perhaps a fun linguistic device for poets and those involved in literature, right? Um, what was really awesome about Lakoff's work and his contribution to cognitive science is Lakoff and Johnson they did a great job of arguing for the importance of metaphor, not just in language, but in cognition, okay? And what we, dis as we reviewed in the last examples of conceptual metaphor, like the surgeon is a butcher, the butcher is a surgeon, life is a journey, love is a journey, right? We saw that there's actually some very interesting conceptual work that metaphor is playing, right? It's not just about poetry, but in some sense, maybe most of our thoughts are metaphorical in some sense, 
right? And that I think that's a very interesting and important insight. So that's what's meant here. Metaphor is not simply an interesting poetic device, but rather metaphor is an important cognitive tool. So a domain of knowledge is characterized by hierarchical structured frames on the conceptual metaphor view, okay? And structured frames are just complex schemas or mental structures that organize knowledge. Each frame makes use of primitive concepts and conceptual metaphors. Lakoff and Johnson suggest that important concepts like event, action, causation, mind, the self, morality, and being are understood via conceptual metaphors. Lakoff suggests that regular correlations in real world embody experience establish primitive conceptual metaphors. And I have to discuss some of the evidence to help you really get clear on this point, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about embodied cognition and some of the evidence in support of embodied cognition, okay? So according to the theory of embodied cognition, physical concepts like running and jumping or kicking and punching Concepts like chairs and people, all these concepts are partially grounded in and understood through the sensor motor system. So our understanding of kicking, for example, partially involves activation of leg versus hand areas of the brain, right? And, and we can uh, discover this from results in neuroscience, okay? And I'll talk about some of the evidence from neuroscience here in a moment. Also though, our understanding of kicking primes leg versus hand responses in reaction time tasks. And this can be shown through psychology. And what I'm trying to show here in these three points is that results, findings for embodied cognition can come in different ways, right? We can get support from embodied cognition from neuroscience. We can also get support for embodied cognition from different behavioral results from psychology, okay? And what's awesome is that we see converging evidence from neuroscience and the behavioral sciences like psychology, okay? So remember we had been talking about um, views like theoretical views in the cognitive sciences and how um, the strongest view for an issue is one that has converging evidence, right, towards that view, right? And so here what we're seeing is that embodied cognition has evidence that converges from the neurosciences and the behavioral sciences, which is nice, okay? So we see from looking at the brain um, that kicking partially activates uh, certain areas of the brain, um, those that are um, involved in um, in the observation of kicking, as well as the initiation of kicking, as well as the reading of words related to kicking, okay? Um, in those cases, the same area of the brain is going to be activated, okay? Similarly for hand activity, when I read a sentence about hands, like punching, like I'm reading an article about boxing, right? I read the word punch, right? And when I punch myself, right? And then when I see someone punch, a certain part of my brain is gonna be activated in all three cases, okay? Which is really interesting, right? And that is neural evidence, right? Neuroscience evidence um, for embodied cognition, right? In some sense, the same cognitive neural circuitry components are being reused for both observation, action, and comprehension, okay, which is really cool, okay. Um, also, um, we see that within psychology, within the behavioral sciences, we can also find evidence for embodied cognition using different measures, right? We can use reaction time measures for in reaction time tasks. So for example, um, reading a kicking word, right? Reading a word like, reading a leg word like kick is gonna prime 
a kicking motion as opposed to a punching motion, right? And reading the word punch will prime a punching motion rather than a kicking motion, okay? So we see that there's a reaction time data that can also give evidence for embodied cognition, okay? If the same cognitive components were, were not involved, right, in both comprehension and action, then there should be no uh, association for the reaction time, okay? And then finally, just one more example for today, um, we can use working memory tasks to also test for embodied cognition, okay? So our understanding of kicking also ties up working memory for leg words versus hand words in memory tasks. Okay, so if I have you doing a complex behavior with your hands, right, you're using neural circuitry for your hands. And because you're already using up that circuitry for your complex hand behavior, it's, this is going to make it harder for you to memorize hand words. Okay, and similarly for the leg case, if I have you doing something, com a complex motor behavior with your legs, it's going to tie up your working memory for the retention of leg related words. Okay, so it's really cool that we can use reaction time, working memory, neuroscience results to find converging evidence for embodied cognition. Okay. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some several different studies in the next few slides. But before moving on, we'll just go ahead and look at some of the, the pictures here. Okay, and here we just see a layout of the brain, right? And here we see the somatotopic representation of leg, arm, and face, right? And the brain right here, okay? And we see that for foot movements, that's represented in blue. And when people are reading leg-related words, we get some overlapping activation, okay? Similarly, when we have finger movements, that's represented in red. And then when we read arm and finger related words, we get a partial reactivation of overlapping areas okay, in red over here. And for tongue movements, right, we see that in green. And for reading face related words, we get partial reactivation in certain areas, right, in the green. Okay, and sort of just drawing um, schematic. In the bottom left, we have sort of the network for leg related words. In the middle, we have the network for arm related words. And on the right, we have the network for face related words. And notice I'm saying network because it's not the case that it's just like, ah, all face words are processed in this one spot and that's it, okay? Uh, neuroscience and the functioning of cognitive functioning, right, is much more nuanced and fine grained than that. Um, so we'll, we won't be looking for like single points of isolation, right, but rather we'll look at wh where in the brain uh, networks of activity are occurring. Uh, the important thing here is that the leg network, arm network, and face network are distinct from each other, okay? Even though they're not like isolated in specific areas, the networks are also distinguishable from each other, okay? So we have distinct networks for foot, um, foot arm, and face um, processing, okay? Which is really cool, I think. And here, uh, in Pulvermuller 2005, we see that um, this, uh, this is where I pulled the images from, brain mechanisms, linking language and action, okay? And in short, reading arm words activates arm areas of the brain. And um, reading uh, leg-related words activates leg areas of the brain. And here's just another picture, right? We love pictures of the brain, things that are at the implementation level, 
And so here's just another picture where we have the arm versus leg words networks, and then the, the brain imaging. All right. So this is just to show you how we can use functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI to see what parts of the brain are selectively activated for leg versus arm movements. Um, also leg versus arm word comprehension. Okay. So that's really cool that we can use fMRI to see that in the brain. In this other article that I wanna talk about right now by Paul Vermuller 2013, here we're gonna still trying to find evidence for embodiment theory. But in this case, we're not looking at an fMRI result, right? We're not looking at imaging data here. Here, I just want us to get practice looking at a different image, right? Several goals of the course is I wanna introduce you to a variety of different content in the cognitive sciences, but also I want us to develop our skills in reading figures and graphs, right? as well as our presentation and paper writing abilities, right? But I think it's very helpful uh, this week to go through different figures across the neurosciences and the behavioral sciences, just to make sure that we are clear on how to read these figures, right? This is a, a very useful skill as you continue your journey on your own. That way you can read any article right, in the neurosciences or the cognitive sciences and be comfortable in reading the figures. All right, so in this study by Paul Vermuller, um, this showed that moving the hands and legs according to a complex motor scheme impairs working memory for arm and leg related words respectively, okay? So performing a complex motor task with the hands led to increased errors in memorizing arm words, but not leg words. And performing a complex motor task with the legs led to increased errors in memorizing leg words, but not arm words. The results from the study suggest that resources in co cortical motor systems engaged by complex body part specific movements are necessary for the processing of semantically congruent action words. Okay, and we can see that here in the figure. I just explained to you the results, but let's look at the figure now, right? We see here, we have on the x-axis, we have arm movements and leg movements. And on the y, we have error, error rate. Okay, so going up means more of an error. Going down means less errors, okay? We see here for arm movements, when a participant is engaging in a complex uh, motor task with the arms, maybe they're juggling, right? We see that for arm words, which is indicated here in the purple, their error rate went up, right? And this is their ability to memorize uh, words that are related to the arms, arm related words, okay? so. As they're juggling, for example, the error rate is up. But notice that even though they're juggling, the error rate for the leg words is down, right? So it's not the case that just because they're juggling, they can't remember anything, right? The complex motor task involving the arms only ties up the cortical circuitry responsible for arm movements. Right, and that's an important thing here. And since that neural circuitry is tied up in the motor task, we have selective impairment for the memorization of arm-related words, okay? Now let's look over at the leg movement. Okay, so we're going over to the leg movement. We see the opposite result, which is really cool. Okay, we see that now, uh, imagine I'm, I'm engaged in a complex motor task with my legs. Maybe I'm sort of like juggling a, a soccer ball with my, my feet, right? Juggling, you know, just like moving the soccer ball around in like a figure eight or some complex figure with my legs, right? We see that when I'm engaged in that leg movement task, 
right? We see that my error rate for leg words, which is represented here in the yellow, we see that now my error rate for leg words went up, but not my error rate for arm words, okay? So again, I wanna emphasize that it's not the case that just engaged in any complex task leads to errors for all words, right? That If that was the case, that wouldn't give support for the embodiment theory, right? That would actually, it may even suggest that there's something flawed with the embodiment theory, right? If, um, if being tied up with my hands equally uh, impaired my knowledge, my memorization of arm and leg words, that might be, that might not, that might be evidence against the embodiment theory, right? But here we see that there's a dissociation, right? That means there's cortical areas that are responsible for arm activity and arm words and different cortical areas or networks responsible for leg activities and leg words, okay? And that's the really cool thing about the, the neuroscience finding about um, the sort of localization, not localization, the, the, the separation right, the effector specific um, uh, distinction, right, between uh, leg and action processing, leg, leg and arm processing for um, actions and words, comprehension, word comprehension. All right, so I hope that this, this figure makes it super clear, right, like, just look at how clear this figure is, is that complex motor action for the arms leads to error for the arm, but not the leg, for the words, right? The memorization of those words. And the opposite is the case for when we're engaged in complex leg actions, that that leads to impairment for leg words, but not for arm words, okay? All right, awesome. Now, one more study. Well, at least I think I have one or a few more studies. Okay. Here, we're going to look at a TMS study. So before we looked at an fMRI study, we also looked at, uh, this is, excuse me, more of like a psychology study in that it's looking at, here we're not looking at imaging data, but we're inferring the that a similar cognitive component is responsible for motor action and compre language comprehension because of its effect on um, memory for certain word types. Okay, so this result is more of like a psych psychology level result. Okay, um, here we're going back to a little bit of neuroscience, right? We can see a brain here, right? We're focusing on. Um, TMS in this study, okay? TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And what we're gonna do in this study is uh, before in the last study, in, in the previous study using fMRI, we had people engage in tasks, right? Like either engage in an action like punching or kicking or engage in an action, a linguistic action like comprehend uh, punching or kicking word. Right. And what we're doing is we had them engage in the task. And then we looked at what areas of the brain um, became selectively activated. Right. We were looking for a bold response or a blood oxygen level dependent response. Right. Um, using fMRI. Here, we're going to do something a little bit different. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to stimulate the brain. Right. Instead of giving a task and seeing what part of the brain becomes selectively activated, here, we're going to selectively. Act, activate certain areas of the brain, okay, and see if it um, helps um, produce the desired effect, okay? So you might think that from the fMRI study, we now have some idea that, okay, like a certain area of the brain is responsible for both kicking, um, observing kicking actions, and also comprehending kicking words, okay? So based on that finding, 
let's now go ahead and like stimulate an area of the brain that is known to be involved in kicking behavior and then see if that stimulation helps facilitate processing of kicking words, right? So we're sort of like going, right? We're, we're using different methods to go back and forth and make sure that we have converging evidence from different methodologies, okay? So in this study, transcranial magnetic stimulation was applied to motor areas in the left language dominant hemisphere while right-handed human subjects made lexical decisions on words related to actions, okay? We're focusing on the left hemisphere in this study because these are right-handed individuals, okay? Uh, the results will look a little different if these were left-handed individuals, okay? We'll have, we'll have more of a, language activity on the right hemisphere for left-handers. So I'm a left-hander and in language studies on left-handers, we get, right, because the left hemisphere is in charge of the right uh, side of the body and the right hemisphere is in charge of the left side of the body, right? The, the brain is in control of the contralateral side of the body, right? So for right-handers, there's gonna be a strong left hemisphere dominance for language. For left-handers, there's gonna be more of a right, um, more activity on the right for left-handers, okay? So here we're gonna see left language dominant activity, okay? And here we see that response times to words referring to leg actions like kick were compared with those two words referring to arm and hand actions, like pick or punch. And what we see here is that TMS, right, transcranial magnetic stimulation of hand and leg areas differentially influenced the processing of arm and leg words, right? So check it out. We see that arm areas, um, arm area TMS, led to faster arm than leg word responses. And leg area TMS led to faster leg than arm word responses. Okay, so come with me over here to this figure. And we see that we're focusing here on TMS to the left, okay, on, on this side, okay. And we see on the y-axis, we have response time in milliseconds, okay. So lower is quicker. Right, so quicker response is down towards the bottom. I'm taking longer to respond. I'm slower to respond if we're going up in the response time, okay? And what do we see? When we have TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation to an arm site, right? When we stimulate a known arm site, look what happens, we have response time is lower, right, than for, uh, for arm words than for leg words, okay? So if you look over here, arm words are, is this lighter shaded box right here. And leg words is in this darker shaded box right here. And we see that the darker shaded box for leg words is higher on response time then the lighter shaded box for arm words, right? The lighter shaded box for arm words is lower in the response time than the leg words. So what that means is when we apply TMS to the left hemisphere in right-handed individuals, right? In this region of interest, we see, right? The arm site, we see that we, um, have a faster response to arm words than leg words, okay? And then when we go over to the leg site, right? A site that is known to be activated for leg actions, right? When we stimulate the leg action site, we get the opposite result, okay? And it's very important that we're getting these opposite results because it's showing us that there's a, a clear distinction between the processing of leg words and leg actions and arm words and arm actions, okay? 
So here we see, just to be very clear, remember that leg words are in the dark shaded box and arm words are in the light shaded box. And then when the leg site is stimulated, right? When the leg site receives the TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, now the response time for legs is faster than the response to arm words, okay? So again, when we stimulate arm areas, we have preferential um, response time for arm words as opposed to leg words. And when we stimulate the leg site with TMS, we have preferential response for uh, leg words rather than arm words, okay? In general, applying TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, to a site on the, the brain, right, will quicken the response time for that effector relevant word, okay? Words that are relevant to that effector's region, okay? Which is really cool. What you may do, for example, to uh, replicate and extend this study is now go ahead and try to stimulate like a mouth area or a mouth site, right? And then see if that uh, brings down the reaction time of mouth words as opposed to like arm words or leg words, right? And that's the idea of what we're trying to do here with the stimulation of the sites, okay? So I hope that was a fun way for us to get clear on how we can use fMRI to see how certain areas of the brain are responsible for uh, arm actions, observations, and comp language comprehension versus leg actions, observations, and word comprehension, okay? We could use fMRI to find those differences. We can also use TMS to see those differences. We can also use different behavioral studies um, to also find those differences, okay? And then finally, this is the last uh, study, okay, uh, by Aziz Zida and colleagues. Uh, this, this article was published in Current Biology, right? And here in this study, participants observed actions and read phrases relating to foot, hand, or mouth actions, okay? In the premotor cortex of the left hemisphere, a congruence was found between effector-specific activations of visually presented actions and actions described by little phrases, okay? So what, what this means is in the left hemisphere, right? In the, so for right-handers, the left hemisphere, the contralateral side, right? That's the side that's gonna be dominant for language. We see a congruence, right? A similar part of the brain is active for effector specific actions, like when I punch, and then when I um, read a, a literal phrase describing actions using that effector. So when I read a sentence like, you know, Bob punched Bill or whatever. Okay. Um, so again, within the ventral premotor cortex, responses strongest for the mouth were located ventrally, whereas responses strongest for the hand were located dorsally, right? We just get differential activation for the processing of leg actions and words versus arm actions and words and versus hand, um, mouth actions and words, okay? These results suggest a key role of mirror neuron areas in the reenactment of sensory motor representations during conceptual processing of actions invoked by linguistic stimuli, okay? And here, just so we can look at the figure, let's uh, get some practice reading this figure. Uh, let's just go ahead and look at the left hemisphere again, okay? Because this is for right-handed individuals and they're gonna be, have the left, have left hemisphere dominance for language, okay? And here we're looking at pre-motor regions of interest. Okay, and here we see that this is the mouth region of interest, right? So this is regions of interest known to be active for mouth actions. This is 
premotor regions known to be active during hand actions. And this is premotor regions known to be active during foot actions. Okay. And we know this through previous fMRI studies and through previous research. Now what we do is we um, present them with mouth phrases, hand phrases, or foot phrases. So we see that mouth phrases are in pink or salmon. This is like a salmon color. Hand phrases are in purple and foot phrases are in like a greenish, light greenish color, okay? What we have here on the y-axis is signal change, okay? The signal uh, uh, change in response to being presented with these different types of phrases, okay? And what we see here, right? We don't even need to look at, read all these words. We can just read it right off of the figure, right? We see that the mouth region of interest, right? The mouth premotor region of interest shows the greatest signal change in response to mouth phrases as opposed to hand and foot phrases, right? So this area that is responsible for um, the premotor area responsible for the mouth, for mouth actions, also shows the greatest signal change in response to mouth phrases, right? Which is really cool, right? And another way to see, to see that is that the bar here for mouth phrases is the highest or on this mouth region, okay? Next, we see that in um, the hand premotor region of interest, right? That in this region, that we get the greatest signal change for hand phrases, right? So this region that's involved for um, the, this region, the hand premotor region for action is also the one that shows the greatest signal change for hand phrases. And we see that the hand phrases box is higher than the mouth and foot phrases box, okay? And then finally, we see that for the foot premotor region of interest, that in this region, that this region also shows the highest signal change for foot phrases, right? As opposed to hand and mouth phrases, okay? So we see that this region, right, is like tuned especially for foot phrases as well as foot actions. More so, it's more sensitive to foot actions and phrases than to mouth and hand actions and phrases. Okay, and this area, right, the hand premotor region of interest is more sensitive or selectively tuned for hand phrases and actions than mouth and foot phrases and actions. And over here, the mouth premotor region of interest is more selectively tuned for uh, mouth phrases and actions than hand and foot phrases and actions. Okay, so what we see is that there's areas of the brain that um, are in some sense selectively activated for kicking actions, observations, and language comprehension. Another uh, network for hand actions, observations, and language comprehension, and another for uh, foot. Did I say feet? I, I, I'm trying to... I was trying to specify mouth, hand, and foot, right? Mouth, one network for mouth uh, actions, observations, and language comprehension. Another area for hand actions, observations, and language comprehension. And yet another network for foot actions, observations, and language comprehension, okay? So that's really cool that we see regions that disassociate from foot, hand, and mouth. Right, and then we also see um, those areas being used for language action and observation, okay, which is really, really cool, okay. So going over these studies highlights both the embodied nature of cognition, right? That even when I'm understanding words like kick and punch, 
part of my understanding, part of my comprehension of those words involves a reenactment, right? A re-engagement, reactivation of the same areas that are involved in kicking myself, right? So part of what it means, part of what is involved in understanding the word kick, right, is part is reactivating the same areas that are involved in me kicking myself. Or when, and also when I observe others kick, right? Part of what's involved in me observing others kick and understanding that is that I also partially reactivate or simulate that in my own brain and mind, right? When I see you kick, part of my areas that are involved in me kicking are also active, at least, at least partially, right? And so we see that the evidence that we looked at highlights the embodied, right, nature of cognition, as well as the, the sort of social simulation nature of cognition as well, the, the, the mirror nature of simulation, okay? And, you know, we, we uh, neurons that are responsible, right, and they're, they're distributed throughout the brain. There isn't just like one neuron, um, there isn't just like one part of the brain that's like a mirror neuron region, but there's mirror neurons distributed across the brain. And essentially we call mirror neurons, neurons that are partially activated both during observation and action. Okay, so uh, we see through the lecture today, evidence for both mirror neurons, right? Neurons that are active both during action and observation, as well as evidence for embodied cognition. All right, so I hope that was a helpful introduction to embodied cognition. Um, there's many more examples. And actually, I, I, I teach or I was teaching uh, every semester a course on embodied approaches to mind and language. And I spent the whole semester just talking about studies that show um, support for this view. Okay, and I think this is really cool work that's going on here. Okay, but anyway, moving on, we don't want to spend a whole semester on this today. Um, Lakoff similarly suggests that emotion metaphors arise from the physiology of emotions, right? So not only is part of our understanding of kicking grounded in kicking behavior or kicking activation, but also part of our understanding of a metaphorical statement like Bob's boiling with anger, right? That's partially grounded in our elevated body temperature that's associated with the physiology of anger, okay? Excuse me, you can see that an approach here is trying to ground concepts like kick, punch, right, in the body. Similarly, ground concepts like boiling with anger, right, into the body, right, with like the physiology of our anger, right. And there's studies that suggest, or at least Lakoff um, mentioned site studies, refers to studies that suggest that people that are angry experience um, elevated body temperature, right? And if that's the case, then we can see that uh, Lakoff may be correct, right? And that we can ground um, these metaphorical statements about the emotions into the body, the physiology of emotions, okay? So Lakoff argues that metaphorical inferences arise via the neural simulation of situations that are understood via the activation of metaphor mapping circuits. Uh, research by Singer and colleagues found that the bilateral anterior insula and the anterior cingulate were particularly active both when participants were in physical pain and when they observed a loved one in physical pain. Okay, so we had been talking before about areas of the brain that are active both when kicking and when observing others kick and when reading about kicking words. Here we're showing that this isn't just about physical actions like kicking and punching, but also that areas of the brain that process physical pain are also active when we observe another, a loved one in physical pain, right? So this sort of re-simulation or reactivation is not just for like motor action, but also for experiences like pain, okay? So we see that the embodied framework may apply more generally across um, cognitions and emotions. All 
Other research by Williams and Barr found that subjects holding a cup of warm coffee were more likely to evaluate another individual as socially warm and friendly than subjects holding a cup of cold coffee. Okay. Research by Zhang and Liljenquist found that students that were told a particular book was important judged it to be heavier than another book that they were told was unimportant. The main point here is that a growing literature and cognitive science suggests that our concepts are partially grounded in sensory motor activity, right? And we see the reason I discuss these two studies is because they highlight, right, the fact that our, um, our concepts, our knowledge, right, extends not just, it extends in, um, in a metaphorical way, right? What I'm trying to show here is that these findings apply to conceptual metaphor theory, right? The fact that are holding a cup of warm coffee, right? When I hold a cup of warm coffee, that'll motivate me to evaluate another individual as being more socially warm, right? Friendly, right? That shows that our cognitions are not purely literal, but are in some sense open to that metaphorical mapping that was suggested by Lakoff earlier, right? Um, similarly, when you hold something heavy or when you believe a book is heavier um, and we associate um, the heaviness of something with its importance, right? Like, ah, oh, that was a really heavy book or a really heavy lecture, right? We, we, often use that term to mean that it was important, right? So we see that when we um, are holding something heavy, right? That this influences our cognition of how important, or when we understand something to be heavy, it influences our cognition of how important it is, right? And again, this is just showing that we're not cognizing in a purely literal manner only, right? But that there is a conceptual application, right? Metaphor is being applied um, um, throughout our cognitions, okay? And these are just two examples in which we see conceptual metaphor, right? Um, evidenced in the data. And there's lots of really cool studies that are like this, okay? Interestingly enough, results from research in cognitive science suggest that brain areas involved in processing physical stimuli, such as physical warmth, are also involved in processing social stimuli, such as social warmth or friendliness. So that metaphorical cognition may play a more central role in cognition than previously thought. All right, we're almost there. Uh, finally, Lakoff argues that grammar allows us to combine metaphors to produce an unlimited range of new metaphorical ideas. Okay, so Lakoff is still on board with the productive nature of language. And I think this is an interesting way to think about, uh, another way to think about how language can be productive, not purely through sort of literal meaning, right? We were looking at syntax and semantics before, focusing on literal meaning, right? And we saw how syntax allows us to be highly systematic and productive, okay? Even when we're just dealing with literal meanings. But here we see that language can allow us to be cognitively productive in another sense, not just literally, but also metaphorically, okay? Uh, another thing that Lakoff argues is that he argues against the view that there is a single module in the brain that handles language, metaphor, and abstract thought. So in contrast to the Chomsky view, in which there may just be a universal grammar, right? Sort of like one cognitive module responsible for our linguist ability, our linguistic competence, right? Uh, on this view of conceptual metaphor, Language is not due to a single module, but is rather more interconnected with the sensor motor system, right? We saw that uh, when I, for my understanding of kick, right? 
that this is actually involving uh, other areas of the brain that are connected to action and observation and not just language comprehension, right? So here we see that um, conceptual metaphor theory is going to tie language more intimately with the sensory motor system, okay? And other subsystems within our cognitive system, okay? And even with our emotional system as well, okay? Whereas the other view that we have been discussing previously, right? The one that we discussed in the beginning to highlight the productive and systematic nature of language, um, we see that that view takes a more modular approach to language cognition. Okay, and as we think about language cognition, remember that this is just a way for us to think about cognitive science more generally, right? And whether the mind in general is best accounted for through um, a modular view or a more sensor motor view and so on. Okay, so I hope that as I share these different views and theories with you, as well as share some data with you, you can start to form your own, your own opinions about what view you ultimately find most convincing. Okay. Okay, so to wrap up the lecture, we had um, we covered quite a bit today. Okay, so again, what we did today is we covered the distinction between intention and convention, right? And we use a comparison with language to money to see how uh, we can't mean I can't mean stop by go purely based on my intention because meaning is partly based not just on intention, but also on social conventions. Okay. We then looked at Wittgenstein, the early and late Wittgenstein, um, to compare and contrast the picture theory of meaning and usage based accounts of meaning. Okay. Um, after we got clear on those two views of meaning, we then looked at lexical semantics and we looked at the um, standard criterial attribute account of categorization versus the prototype account of categorization, right? And we saw that the standard um, criterial attribute account is based on necessary and sufficient conditions, whereas the prototype account is not based on necessary and, necessary and sufficient conditions but more on exemplars, best prototypes and goodness of example ratings, okay, with graded membership, okay. Um, we then looked at the distinction between the dictionary account of meaning and the encyclopedic account of meaning, okay. Whereas the dictionary account uh, tied meaning purely to the dictionary definition of a concept, Whereas the encyclopedic account tied the, the concept to its background contextual information, okay? We then, after we realized that it's the encyclopedic um, account of meaning and the prototype account of categorization that scaffold the lexical semantic approach, okay? We also looked today at conceptual metaphor and we saw some examples of metaphorical statements and like the surgeon is a butcher and the butcher is a surgeon to help us get clear on um, conceptual metaphor and a source domain and target domain, okay? And how we understand metaphorical statements by applying uh, concepts from the source domain to the target domain, okay? And that helps us get clear on the valence of the metaphorical statement, okay? Then we moved on to discuss um, conceptual metaphor, metaphor theory in more detail. And we looked at a lot of the evidence from cognitive science, especially the neurosciences, uh, to see some um, evidence in support of that view, okay? We saw how um, certain areas of the brain are selectively activated for um, action, observation, and comprehension, right? For kicking, punching, and uh, chewing or mouth-related words, 
Okay, and that would only be the case on the embodied view, right? That that result is not uh, hypothesized by a uh, disembodied view of language. Okay, um, uh, I hope that you uh, found the discussion today interesting, and I want to thank you for your attention today. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our next le lecture on um, introduction to neuroscience and the neuroscience of language.